Welcome to Group Talk, a monthly podcast conversation from the Small Group Network, focusing on topics relevant to small groups ministries. Whether you're in a church of 100 or 10,000, whether you are a volunteer or staff, we want to support, encourage, and equip you to lead well. So relax and listen to today's program. Welcome to Group Talk. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Carolyn Takeda, your host and the small groups pastor at Calvary Community Church in Westlake Village, California. Well, some of you might remember last year when we had a book review conversation on Priya Parker's book, The Art of Gathering. And that was kind of a fun experiment we tried, um, but we got so much positive feedback about that episode. So I've asked my friends Nick and Andrew to return to discuss another popular book that addresses issues very relevant to small group point people. So today we're going to be talking about talking. I know, it's kind of ironic, but that is the, the title of the book is called We Need to Talk and How to Have Conversations That Matter by S- Celeste Headley. And she's an experienced journalist, interviewer, radio host, and her TED Talk on 10 Ways to Have Better Conversation has been viewed 14 million times. So as point group people, um, we communicate constantly, and our conversations are the core of what we do, especially as we shepherd people. And we may even think that we're pretty good at it. But um, as she points out in her book, that being a talker, even an articulate a communicator, does not make you a good conversationalist. And that was pretty convicting. In fact, most of this whole book is pretty convicting, so I hope you'll enjoy uh, what we're going to discuss. And Nick and Andrew, thank you so much again for being on the program. Thank yeah. you for having us. Pleasure to be here. You didn't realize that you were signing up for multiple of these. (laughs) Um, Okay, so let me tell you just a little bit about Andrew and Nick. Andrew Camp is currently the spiritual growth pastor at Mountain Life Church in Park City, Utah, where he served since 2016. And he also contributes monthly to our small group network blog. Um, And Nick Lency is the dinner group director at Hoboken Grace Community Church in Hoboken, New Jersey. And he also serves the small group network as our finance director. And we actually became friends through the network and found that we had a couple things in common. First was that we're all readers and we enjoy talking about what we learn from books. Um, And then the second thing was that we all had occupations prior to entering small groups ministry um, that were different than regular ministry. So Andrew was a chef, I was an attorney, and Nick was a Wall Street financial analyst. And I mentioned that because when we read books and talk about them, we kind of approach them from different perspectives, mm-hmm. which I think is helpful. So, Andrew, why don't you kick us off? Um, give us an overview of the book. Why, why did you want us to discuss this book? Uh, thanks, Caroline. Yeah, the book is really divided into two parts. Um, part one really gives us some broad overview of conversations and really looking at where we are as a society and uh, the sad truth that we actually need a book about <laughs> right. conversation. Um, you know, she mentions the fact that we teach kids so many other things in school, but yet we never teach them how to right. actually be good conversationalists, good listeners. Um, you know, and then she dives into the, the role of technology um, and uh, non-face-to-face communication that just pervades all of our, what we think is communication. Um, and then part two, she, t- she gives us 10 great, simple yet difficult strategies yes. on mm-hmm. how to actually be good conversationalists. And, you know, she challenges us to pick one or two um, and just really hone in and think and notice how often you break it, but then how then to actually um, practice better conversational skills. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, so, Nick, what did you get out of this book and what made you want to read it? Yeah, so what made me want to read it is, uh, you know, typical scrolling through Facebook. And <laughs> my my aunt ended up sharing this post that uh, f- from this author. And it was just about, like, the conversations that we have and how we tend to always want to jump in and add our element of whatever the same issue is. So, uh, example is, you know, oh, I'm feeling tired and the other person responds back, oh, yeah, so I'm tired too kind of thing. And, and I just see that happening in groups all the time where we're either cross-talking or we're mm-hmm. constantly trying to fix people or we're trying to relate. And we think that it's healthy, but it actually can sometimes hurt more than it helps. And just seeing that and relating to it and knowing our group leaders experience that too, I just like grabbed onto it. And then when I saw she had a book, (laughs) I was like, okay, I'm interested in learning more about this. And then one of the things I was, uh, love about too, is the, the, is it a subtitle? What's the, Oh yes. The subtitle is how to have conversations that matter. And then when you think about small groups, I really think that that's like 
one of the reasons why our small groups exist is because we want to have these conversations that matter. We don't just want to gather weekly just to hang out and get to know each other, but we want to have things that matter. And I think that's, you know, everything in, that we're trying to do in life, you know, once we want to bring meaning to it. And so I saw that and I was, they kind of hook, lined and sinkered me on that, that subject. Yeah. So. And it's a, to sharpen our tool on that yeah. as leaders um, is huge. Yeah. Um, so in book and part one, as Andrew, as you mentioned, book one is just about conversations in general. So let's just talk about that real quick before we dive into part two, which is the really okay. convicting parts. Um, so she talks in book one about setting the stage. And I love this piece about setting expectation for conversations that a lot of times we just rush into a conversation without any goal in mind or any concept of what we want to get out of it. So she talks about, you know, if you know, just take a moment and figure out what is it you're trying to accomplish in the conversation. Is just to be with people? Is it to, to communicate certain particular thing? Is it to create change or something that it'll streamline and make the conversation more effective? What are some other um, pieces in part one that struck you? Yeah. Uh, so just to hop on, the, the part you just talked about stood out a lot to me of, of one of the things she talks about is having clear expectations that are set. And um, one of the things that we try to do in our group ministry is make sure that the group members that are a part of that group know what their expectations are too. And thankfully, we've been able to boil that down to just three simple things, which is show up, join in, and be real. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when someone comes to group, we want them to show up and not just to to be there physically, which is obviously important, but to also mentally be present um, is, is just super important. And it's one of the things that she also dives into is just how much technology kind of can interrupt that being mentally present. That just was a theme throughout the book of how much technology really drives that away. And, you know, even as I'm sitting here, I have my <laughs> cell phone out because that's just where my notes are. And it, this book has been eating me alive at how much it, it actually is like ruining conversations and dragging me away. And um, the other thing that was just really powerful was her just talking about, you know, we think that we have the ability to multitask, yes. but we just yes. absolutely can't. And that like scientifically the left brain just can't handle Right. more than one thing at a time. So even though we're in a conversation and we get a text and we go oh, two seconds, like it's not possible for us to be present and respond to that text message at the same time. So That's a good point. What about you, Andrew? Is there anything in part one that uh, resonated? Yeah, just the importance of emotion in conversation mm. that we bring our whole selves into the conversation mm. and that the role of emotion in conversations are emotion emotionally laden. Um, mm -hmm. And our tendency especially in small groups or in um, church settings is somebody shares something emotionally like, Hey man, I just feel like God is absent during me. You know, and we respond with a Bible verse like, Oh no, Jesus is always present with you. And you're like, well, <laughs> thanks, but that doesn't actually help me. And so she just talks about that responding to emotion with logic never helps a conversation, but right. shuts mm. it down. Um, and so just as a small group point person, just how do we validate the emotional aspect of conversations and not just throw in a cliche or a Bible verse uh, thinking we're helping. Right. I think um, that piece of it, why is it you think that people do that? Why do we have this tendency to do that, to just kind of throw a, an easy answer at it rather than to respond to the emotion? I think it's just natural that we want to help them. So mm -hmm. I think about this often of, a, of an area where I can improve is, you know, often I'll be having conversations with my group leaders and they'll come and they'll say something along the lines of like, I'm really frustrated with the attendance in my group. <laughs> yes. And I'll jump in immediately with logic and like, all right, here's the three things you Have need you to try. Da, 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 da. And like, now that I think about it is like, man, that's an opportunity for me to dive deeper mm -hmm. into like, how, so how does that make you feel when people don't show up? Or like, what are the things that you're going through? Because in that specific example where people don't show up, like sometimes it's that they get so frustrated yeah. that people that aren't there, that they just damage the relationships of the people that are there and dig them even mm -hmm. further deeper. Sure. But sure. Uh, like, but then I'm also making that assumption that they're feeling that way right. as opposed to like seeing if that's one of the mm -hmm. things that's actually there. So, and understanding them, which is a big part of the book is conversations are there to understand. Where you're really listening versus just hearing. She does a really good job of explaining the difference between the two. And a lot of that, like you said, Andrew, is about the emotion. So in your example, Nick, it might be something like they're coming expressing frustration. 
it may be because they're they're more performance oriented and they're feeling like a failure and then maybe God's disappointed, Nick, you're disappointed, and there's deeper issues that have nothing to do with the attendance, but it's indicative indicative of something else going on spiritually. Mm-hmm. Right. And then the other key point too is that we sometimes are uncomfortable yes. with that very theme. Yes. You know, and so we don't know how to handle it. I don't know how to handle it. I might be wrestling with the same thing. And so in order to alleviate my own anxiety, I want to fix something like Nick was saying or just try to move past it quicker than rather than being empathetic um, and entering into the situation with them. That's yeah. so true. I wonder too a little bit, this is just a thought I just had, but you know, I think sometimes we forget that we're also pastors in these situations. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that is care. And so a lot of times we think they're coming to us because of oh, they have the expertise. And so like I get in those conversations, they want to meet with me. Oh, they want to hear the expert side, (laughs) which is probably such a lie because it's probably just like, hey, I want to express this and have someone care about this situation with me. And I miss that opportunity because I'm going in with... We gotta fix it with logic. Like, yes. let's let's find the answer. Right, right. No, that's <laughs> true. Um, okay, so let's jump into part two. Which I don't know if you guys can relate, but as I was reading part two, and there's ten bad habits and specific strategies that she says will immediately improve the conversations you have every day. Um, she says you, to improve these, you have to first unlearn the bad habits. And I literally went through. I do that, I do that, I do that. And I think I had like all 10 marked off and it was like, dang, I don't know how to have a conversation. <laughs> it's kind of how it, how it went. So what are some ones that kind of convicted you guys? Well, I think what Nick started to say was the idea of the multitasking and that we mm-hmm. can't be multiple places. Um, and so as I was thinking about it, one of her first tips, you know, is be there or go elsewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, and how do we, as people are rushing into small groups, our small groups, um, as leaders are trying to get ready, and there's a myriad of things, how do we help them prepare to have a conversation? And she talks, she ends the chapter talking about meditation, um, which is easy for us Christians just to think, okay, how sure. can we prayerfully set the stage mm-hmm. for people, quiet the hearts, center ourselves, um, and not just a rote prayer. Like mm-hmm. we all start small group with a prayer that may, you know, it's good, but how do we use that time to really allow people then to enter into conversation, to be present. I like to, she wanted to add to that. One of the other things she was saying about meditation is how she noticed how it has helped strengthen her to have patience in situations, which I think like the more we're able to get into prayer too, it's going to help us develop the habit of being patient Mm -hmm. where, um, you know, we have listening to God Mm -hmm. is something that's sort of a habit and then to be able to bring that into the conversations we have with people. Um, one of the other ones I have here is just that like she gets into how response times are actually quicker than what we can actually think. And the reason that we're able to respond in conversation is because we've, we're in our head, sure. we're already forming our response as someone's talking and how we have to kind of slow that down and continue to listen to what the person's saying before we come in with the response. Right. I, um, yeah, that's really good. The one that got me above all the other ones is she has a section on it's not the same. Mm-hmm. And um, this was so interesting because we tend to think, hey, I've had an experience similar to your experience. So when you tell me about your experience, I want to be empathetic. Therefore, I'll say, hey, me too. And then I'll share my experience. But she talk about that being conversational narcissism, that we then turn the focus back on ourselves rather than the person who's sharing. Um, and Andrew, you did a blog post about this book in preparation probably it's like a two for for you exactly on the book and you gave a really great example of how to shift that response to where it's it is empathetic but also still focused on the other person caring for them yeah she talks about the difference between a shift response versus a support response and like you were saying in our conversational um, narcissism that we all do um, I'm, I think I did it the next day after reading this chapter <laughs> Um, in our shift response, we shift the focus back to ourselves, mm. um, where if somebody says, hey, I'm just feeling really busy, you know, we respond with me too, um, versus a support response where if somebody says, hey, I'm just feeling really busy, overwhelmed, um, we, re- we respond with a question of like, can you tell me more? Or what's going on that is making you feel that busy? So we're we're actually asking them to go deeper and to get more out of them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's even worse. Not only are we saying me too, we're saying, you think you're busy? Well, let me tell you what I've got going on. And then we kind of do the one upmanship 
piece in conversations, you know, that you can hear it. So after reading the book, in every conversation, I'm like evaluating, critiquing my part, the other person's part. I mean, it's ruining conversations for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what are some other tips that she gives that are um, easy and yet difficult? One that do? stood out for me, especially as um, we, a small group point people, we think about talking to our senior pastor. And mm. How can we help him? Um, she has a, one of her tips is to keep it short. Um, and so as you're thinking about what do you need to communicate to your senior pastor, don't overwhelm him with everything, but what's one or two points that you need him to understand that he can then communicate um, clearly um, and cast that vision for versus just giving him 10 pages of material. Yeah, I, I, I think to tag on to that, you use the example of talking to a senior pastor, even like when you go into a meeting with your staff, if, if you have a staff or whether it's volunteer or, or whoever it may be. I, I think of that also when it comes to when we are, those who do the sermon-based model or things like that, where you're putting questions out and developing that is it's so much better to have one next step as opposed to like, let's get them to take these three things like in keeping it simple. uh, I thought was really powerful point that she had. Yeah. And she has such an emphasis on asking questions and following up and having a humble curiosity and a learning posture. So she says, you know, you can learn something from anyone. Um, So in a small group setting, if people have that posture, then you're not trying to convince each other of your view but rather you just open yourself up to understand what their view is and then take some of the pressure off too. You don't have to try to persuade people. And a lot of times now in our culture, it's not, you're probably not going to, and it's going to be more than one conversation anyway. Right. So to do the work of kind of having that open handed posture of, I just want to learn and put myself in your shoes. And why do you think that? And I mean, a lot of that is a lot more work probably than us just pontificating our position. So I think maybe that's one of the barriers, right? That it, this takes more time, more mental, emotional energy. And she, she mentions that, that like concentrated listening, focused listening, attentive listening actually requires glucose from our brains. That is the re- and that's part of the reason we feel so tired after those intense conversations. Right. Versus if we're actually talking about ourselves, we actually get um, like a dopamine hit. That's right. Like we get an adrenaline rush. So it, 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 our brains are not wired this way. Um, and so it does take that effort. It takes learning. And then you compound that with our society's issues. Yeah. Um, we're just, how small groups actually ever happen in a church is a miracle in and of themselves. <laughs> well, that's really hopeful. Actually. Yeah, well, hey, it's Jesus. <laughs> She also talks about the power of admitting when you don't know something. I know in our training, we typically tell our leaders, it's totally okay to say, I don't know, and I'll go find out. But people are so uncomfortable with that. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is, is I wonder if she says it better than the way I do, because I'm the same way that you just said, where it's like, it's okay to say this, but she says the hardest three words to say and admitting that it's hard to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so not just saying that it's okay, but like, hey, it's hard to say this, but this is what you should like to not, to not know. The quote I wrote down that she says is, when you pretend to know more than you you do, you will eventually give someone bad advice or prevent them from seeking the guidance of real bona fide experts. And, um, you know, that's just huge with your group leaders because we want them to say those hard words of, I don't know. So we have that rush to answer and we all have people in groups that have the Bible answers, the kind of the people that are the fix it. I wonder how we can help our leaders understand that the process or the conversation itself is the goal. Like, have you guys done a good job of, of trying to communicate that piece? I would say for myself, <laughs> I'm being honest, no, because like after reading this book, it's like I have so much homework to do. Like just even getting like getting technology reduced and the notifications down and uh, not running into re- like it's just so natural to try to relate to someone else's pain. And it's mm-hmm. just like not it, I struggle to say like it's not appropriate, but like it's not necessary, I think is the better thing to say there. 
And knowing when, like we were talking before, we're taping about sometimes it may be appropriate to share your pain. Like say somebody is dealing with a job loss and they share that. And for someone in the group to say, hey, I went through that season and that was really hard. There's a way to share it in a way that doesn't hijack the conversation where the person feels cared for. But other times it just ends up being about, you know, the interrupting to share my story. And yeah. so there's some, I'm not training. I feel like if we could equip our leaders to do that, well, first we got to get better at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we equip our leaders to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I think another really important thing that she talked about, this was in chapter eight for her, but it was talking about how like tensions will increase with the passage of time. Mm. And I see that as another area as a group director, pastor, where, Sometimes you will start to avoid conversations that you don't want to have because you know they're difficult. Mm. But the longer that you allow them to continue yes. on, the yes. harder they become to have. Or the more that you end up hurting the individual because you like you didn't have that conversation sooner. Right. And so I think that's a really big one that is another area where I, I just have to constantly be aware of like, all right, address it as soon as I see it as opposed to yes. allowing that to go on. Yes. Absolutely. That's good. Uh, well, we're almost um, out of time. But before we wrap up, though, I wanted to give you guys a chance to share your favorite quote from the book or just one takeaway that you wanted to share with our listeners. Um, one of the quotes that I really liked, and this has to do with kind of how I don't do conversations super well, is um, she talks about, she quotes Stephen Covey um, on this. He's that motivational uh, leadership guru guy. And he says, most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. Um, and I was really challenged that that's, when you look at Jesus, he was a master conversationalist. Uh, most of his conversation was in the form of questions or stories or parables. Um, he kept people, and he knew what people needed to hear, and he knew how to elicit that. Um, and he sat with people. He interrupted everything for, you know, for that people. And so I just think, you know, if we, if we kind of have conversations like Jesus, that would be a really good thing. Um, but the idea of, of listening um, and asking for the sake of listening, not for the sake of, of talking, um, is one really good takeaway for me. Yeah. Uh, mine is kind of the attitude that she's trying to develop, which is we're in this culture where like, we feel that we always have to be right mm -hmm. um, rather than seek to understand. And it's okay to like have two different opinions, which I love, but you know, she tells you to help you with like, what if they're right? Is, is one attitude to go in with. And the other one is just assume you have something to learn. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that's like just a huge attitude for us in general that it's one of the reasons I'm a reader is that I just constantly want to be learning and hearing from different voices and, and continuing and expanding that. And I think same thing goes for these conversations. Like what, what can I learn from this individual? Yeah. And one of my favorite quotes was she was quoting actually Mr. Rogers in, in this day and age. Who doesn't love Mr. Rogers? <laughs> But it's in, when she's talking about questions, um, and, but Mr. Rogers um, states, in times of stress, the best thing we can do for each other is to listen with our ears and our hearts and to be assured that our questions are just as important as our answers. Yeah. And that goes back to what you were saying about Jesus and just his questions of what do you want? Mm -hmm. What do you need? Um, and realizing that getting to know that person's heart um, and hearing the heart, the pain, the joy, the struggles, uh, that's the joy of conversation, not mm -hmm. the answers, but the ability just to be with each other and who we become in the presence of each other. And that's what we're called to do in community for one another and with one another. So yeah, well said. Thank you guys so much for being part of this conversation. And if you'd like to connect with Andrew and um, Nick more, they're both active on our Facebook group page. And so you're welcome to interact with them there. Um, so you can search on the Facebook, look for the small group network and the interactive group, and then join in. And if you have other thoughts on this book, maybe you have a confessional about which points you have had a hard time with. Um, she gives really practical things to try. And she actually says, and maybe we should end with this, she actually says, don't try to fix all 10 problems. <laughs> you know, work on one or two, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and then start from there because otherwise it's kind of over overwhelming. That's just great advice in general. Yes, just okay. let's just work on one or two. Yeah. So hopefully this was helpful um, to you. And we thank you so much for listening to Group Talk. God bless you and your ministries.
It's always a treat to have Nick and Andrew on Group Talk. So thank you, Nick, Andrew, and Carolyn, for the great insight on the book, We Need to Talk, by Celeste Headley. Now, before we go, let's talk about Accelerate SoCal. Accelerate SoCal Small Group Workshop is coming up in less than two months. Regular event registration ends June 19th. This is our best event value as it includes registration, lodging, and meals for three days and two nights at the beautiful Rancho Capistrano Retreat Center. Enjoy the beauty of Southern California, grow as a leader, and strengthen your team, and accelerate the health and growth of your small group ministry by attending Accelerate SoCal Small Group Workshop July 8th through the 10th. Go to smallgroupnetwork.com slash events to register. Thank you so much for checking us out this month, and we can't wait to see you next month. Thank you for listening to Group Talk. We invite you to subscribe to the podcast through iTunes and get new episodes downloaded automatically. Also, if you enjoy this program, please take a few minutes to give us a positive rating on iTunes so that other small group point people can find us more easily. We encourage you to visit our website at smallgroupnetwork.com to access our library of free resources, connect to a huddle with other small group ministry leaders in your area, read our blog articles, or join us on our Facebook group. Don't forget to use the hashtag SGNet when engaging with your social media channels. Thank you for your support.